Teddy, can you sit up, please? Can you sit? <laughs> there. there she is. <laughs> Hello, yeah. Kitty, is that right? Teddy. Teddy, sorry, yeah. sorry. So that's Hi, that. Teddy. <laughs> Should we say, uh, should we say hello? Oh, he's, I'm, <laughs> I, I have other things to do, but thank you so much. <laughs> Teddy darling. Teddy's please. already an expert on dog body language. He doesn't need me to help him. <laughs> no, uh, is there something you'd like to say to us? <laughs> woof, <Yeah. okay. laughs> it, Can we do a bit? To you too. <laughs> can we do a little bit louder? Can we say hello? Woof. Thank you very much. This is hello from Teddy and from me, welcoming everyone to Pet Talk. And my wonderful guest today is Brenda Adolf. Hello, Brenda. Hello. It's so lovely to be here with you, Anna, and Teddy as well. Well, Teddy and I, well, let's say I was very impressed with your book. But I think oh, that well, if thank you were able to read your book, he would have been very impressed too just with the fact that somebody has made such a huge effort to understand him and other dogs. So- the Well, I wish he would have been a consultant. I'm sure it would have been a much better effort. <laughs> <laughs> well, the book that I am referring to, of course, is Canine Body Language, a photographic guide interpreting the native language of, domestic, of the domestic dog. And I think that title for me it's so exciting because it's it's everything that I believe in, kind of. Um, yeah. Because you're treating them as though they have a language that is in their own right a language. So it may Absolutely. not be verbal, but it is a language, and I think that I find um, a tremendously exciting um, discovery in your book that you you treat it this way when I'm training a dog I am constantly taking their language as feedback where to go next in my training um, I know it's possible to do you know the black sort of inbox outbox data thing but to me training the animal regardless which species I'm working with, if you're not having a conversation, then, then I, I don't know what you're doing. So to me, that communication is what is satisfying to me as a human. And it's my effort to connect with my friends that I love, regardless whether they're my own pet or someone else's pet that I'm helping. Absolutely. And it's been from the day that Teddy has arrived in our home. <laughs> yeah. My was to understand him and the yep. way that he communicates with me. And he learned far more quickly about me than I did about him. And I think one of the reasons is they, they're just masters at reading body language. Yeah, I tell people all the time, you know, intellectually, I will let a dog off the hook in training all the time because they're not intellectuals, right? And they don't understand our language. And a lot of times the behaviors we're asking them to do don't really make any sense to them whatsoever anyway. Uh, so intellectually, I let them off the hook all the time. But socially, I never let them off the hook because they're socially brilliant. And I'll tell you what I tell my students often when they sort of like, oh, I just can't seem to get this idea across to the dog, but he seems to understand me so well. And so I would say to you, he doesn't have anything else to do today. And you have lots of things to do. You had to prepare for a podcast and you, <laughs> and you have to cook meals and you have to take care of family members. And so I think we're a lot more distracted than they are, which is part of the reason that that happens. But I think the other part is because we're humans, we count on that spoken language so much and our whole brains are set up to acquire spoken language and then to use it with each other to communicate. Not that we don't use body language too, but I think because you know, dogs don't have that same language center, it, I feel like it's happening really differently for them than it is for us. 
I agree. And I think a lot of the body language communication for us is done at a subconscious level. We're not right. Most of us, when we're talking to someone, we're not conscious of the other person's body language. We're focusing on perhaps the facial expressions, maybe mm -hmm. consciously, yeah. and we are definitely focusing on what we're being told. We're not focusing so much on the posture and all those subtle yeah. um, things that happen with body language, whereas they are completely focused on that. Oh, absolutely. And you know, hum human learning styles, um, li like NLP, if you if you're into anything like that, but it, um, you know, there's the kinesthetic, there's the auditory, there's the visual. And I think for dogs, it's, it's probably scent, olfactory, and kinesthetic, I think those would be their first two. Whereas humans, I think we would say probably vision. Visual is, is the most common. And so I think it learning things is a different experience for them than it is for us. And when we're, when we are training them, one of the ways that we can show that we appreciate that fact or understand the student that we're working with is to acknowledge that their language is valid and that it can tell us things. One of the things I tell my students all the time is every move your dog makes is possibly language. I think we watch our dogs move around the house and so on. And we're like, oh, well, they're doing this or they're doing that, or oh, look, he's sniffing. Or, and, and we make a lot of assumptions about what that language might mean in that moment or what, what it means to the dog. I know when I'm training a student, a lot of times, if the dog sniffs the floor, they're like, oh, he's sniffing the floor for food or he's sniffing the floor for scent. Not necessarily. I know that when I'm training a dog, one of the situations I see what I call um, processing sniffing uh, which isn't in the book, by the way, it's in my head, uh, is I'll be working on a task and I might be shaping it or whatever, how, however I'm doing it. And the dog is like, okay, I kind of got that. I'm still a little confused. I'm not quite sure what we're doing. And they're offering things that are kind of close to what I'm looking for in that approximation, but not quite. All of a sudden, I'll finish a I'll finish a trial as and I give them a treat for whatever they just did. And all of a sudden they'll drop their head to the snor the, the floor, the ground, and they'll sniff really intensely for like four or five seconds in one tiny area. And then all of a sudden they'll look up at me and this next trial, they're gonna offer me something very different. And sometimes it's the right thing and sometimes it's the wrong thing. It doesn't matter. But that's why I think it's a a, a way for them to to gather their thoughts, if you will, and and process something only because I've seen that 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 pattern so many times, and all of a sudden there's this huge behavior. Well, significant to me. Um, if you're a beginning trainer, you might not even notice it, but to me it's like, holy cow! Like that's a lot different than they were just doing. And if we don't understand that, we might correct them for the sniffing. So to I me that would change that whole learning process for the dog. And really, I mean, what you're saying is that we need to give them space so that when we're interacting with them and we're asking them to do something and we're teaching them something new, they need to have that thinking time. And it's exactly the same thing you know, when we're working with children. Um, sometimes when we're working with children and we're teaching them something, they need a break. They need a break yeah. because they need to have a little bit of time to, to think. And it's yeah. there's so many children where if you give them a question and you say, I'll come back to you in a minute, and you come back to them, they do so much better because the pressure is off. They've yeah. had to, and we are like that. In work oh, absolutely. Adults are works. <laughs> yeah. It, it, in work Adult learners have a lot of quirks that we have to deal with when we're when we're working with them. But even working, but even in work situations, if your yeah. boss asks you to do something and you're on the spot in a meeting, yeah. you would really appreciate it if you just had a few seconds to think. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it takes a confident adult to say, I'll get back to you on that. I'll, I'll just have a little thing. It does. Yeah, I was lucky. Absolutely. And it also takes a lot of confidence to say I'm wrong. And for dogs, especially if they're getting corrected a lot, or I think you can definitely correct a dog, whatever that means to you. I I mean, obviously, we're going to keep it within reason. But even if that, that said, some dogs, when you correct them, which to me, a correction means we direct them, we redirect them to the original behavior. So if my dog is sitting and they forget or they get distracted and they stand up, I would probably just touch the collar because my dogs understand that touch on the collar. I teach that when I first teach sit. So, you know, I lure the dog into a sit, lure the dog into a sit, feed it, get duration, whatever we're going to do. But at some point, I'll just touch the collar and lure them into the sit and feed that. I like to install a correction like that up front because that is a very mild thing to be able to do. It's more like a reminder to them to do it. And I'd rather do that than a collar pop or you know, grab them by the collar or, and, and, and force them back into the sit. It's a, um, I always wanna do the least. You know, I wanna do the least and just help redirect them back to that because how many times in a day do we forget? I forget all the time. And rather than a harsh correction, I would rather somebody just say, uh, hello, thinking. <laughs> there is no need for a harsh correction. There, I, I would say absolutely categorically, there is never a need for a harsh correction. And, you know, Teddy will, for, as you say, forget things. He gets distracted. One of the things he does, and I have to say, he's the one who instigated this. I never did is that he, when we get home, he goes and brings me my slippers. Now, there's mm-hmm. a long story as to how this evolved. That occurred, he, yeah. There's a long story how it evolved, but this, this is something that he's instigated. He goes, he goes into the kitchen and he always goes with the intention of bringing me my slippers. And then he gets distracted, he has a drink of water. And I watch him, I watch him, he goes, has his drink of water. And then he stands and looks at me and, he's, and he goes, oh yeah, the slippers. And he brings them to you can see exactly. or he'll bring one and then you'll think oh yeah. i think i'll have water he'll have the other one and then he'll kind of forget that he hasn't brought me the second and occasionally i'll say to him teddy can i have the other one please and he looks at me and goes oh yeah where is it oh yeah it's over there and you can see yeah. that exactly what's going through his mind and absolutely there's no need ever for a harsh correction just give them the space and a little, hey, remember? <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it is the idea that we read the dog's body language in order to understand them better so that when we give them feedback during trainer training, it's accurate or it, it makes sense. So for instance, if you said to me, hey, Brenda, how are you today? And I said, you know, dinosaurs and crows like lunchboxes. You might wonder how that relates to, hi, how are you today? Because socially, you're just expecting back good, bad, or, you know, if we're very good friends, I might say, oh my God, Anna, I can't believe this. I need therapy with you today. Or I might just, if I don't know you well, I might say, it's great, regardless of what's going on in my life. Dogs can't even do that, right? All they can do is the truth because we do not get into deception or deceit until we get into the higher primate. So when you look at your dog, and I urge people all the time, take the dog literally. He's, you don't have to, um, we have to guess and interpret because we're not dogs. Uh, So, so I would say that as a disclaimer up front, we have a lot of ideas about dog body language, how accurate it is. Only dogs can tell us and they're not telling us in our language. So all we can do is interpret as best we can, observe what kind of results we get and then say, okay, I think I was pretty darn close on that one. One of the things that I really, first of all, your book is like a a picture dictionary um, of body language. I just want to make, make sure I say that because I want everyone who watches this to know that it's really worth going to get this because it's- Thank you, Anna, thank you. Brilliant and helpful. 
um, from that point of view. But I also love the, the, the introduction that you give and, and how you talk about the dog perspective being um, there's the insider and there's the outsider. This is how they relate yeah. to everything. And oh, I really yeah. feel that, that, filter. Feel that with, with Teddy. He's a very social dog. He's very friendly on the whole. Um, and I say on the whole because he doesn't like everybody and he does certainly doesn't like every dog. He likes dogs he recognizes as being like him. And, and, I, and this is something that I've really, he's a well socialized dog. He met lots of breeds when he was a puppy. He did lots of play. But when he got to adult age, and I, for me, my experience of that was somewhere between 18 months and three, this began to develop. He yep, began agreed. to decide, he began to decide who was like him and therefore was a potential insider. Insider. Who is not like him and is a potential outsider. And I, his friends are roughly his age, some are a bit younger. Um, one or two are a little bit older, but I've seen all of them do this, all of them, well socialized yeah. dogs. I wasn't prepared for this because I was, having done lots of reading, I was under the impression that as long as I had a well socialized dog who didn't have any trauma in his life, he was going to be friendly and a diplomat in all canine situations. That <laughs> And that's not what I see with most of his friends either. It's not, it's not normal. It's, it's no different than us. We behave differently than with friends than we do with people that we don't know well. And we behave differently with um, really close friends that we think share an empathy with us um, that are interested in the same things that we are. We treat those people differently than we do people that don't, even though we know them fairly well. I think we need to allow dogs, or we need to be realistic that dogs are making those same choices, those same social choices. And I think we need to be able to allow them to do that. Now, my dogs were not allowed to fight with other dogs, but they were certainly allowed to have an opinion. And if they had that opinion, you know what? I kept them away from that dog. I can do that for them. That's something I can do for them. And it's something I can do for them that I think helps them stay out of trouble, if you will, socially, so that they don't get into a social situation that is an altercation or conflict, or it could possibly be traumatic, not just for my dog, but for the other dog. Because I now have some miniature poodles, but in my past dog training life, those were exactly the kinds of dogs that I needed to keep my dogs away from. Because they tend to be um, sensitive to other dogs, but kind of super friendly. And my youngest poodle is like, she's assuming everybody loves her. And sadly, she also will, because she can be a little like this. She ignores other dogs' social signals sometimes. If they, if they will let her push them around, what I'm saying is she will absolutely bully them and pester them and try to get her way with them, maneuver their space, whatever. In the past, that was the most dangerous kind of dog for, for instance, my fox terriers to be around because they would take that as a social challenge and they would get very, they could get very nasty. And they, because by merit of their breed um, and mine were some of the older hunting lines, they were pretty quick to make a judgment and pretty quick to act on it. I think Owning dogs like that, that were very particular about their social interactions and had a lot of potential aggression at, at play, even if they weren't currently using it. Um, and they were normally using it. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you think you're the CEO and the janitor walks in and starts giving you advice about the way you're, you're investing the company's stock, I'm pretty sure you're probably just gonna go, thank you so much, I hired you to sweep the floor and dust, I didn't hire you for stock advice, and they might get pretty surety with that. Right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what's gonna happen. Um, in, unless your janitor happened to be Warren Buffett or someone like that, right? In which case you'd probably listen. However, all that said, 
we need to allow dogs to have choices. And when they make a choice, we need to listen to what they say. And if they say they don't like another dog, I think we need to believe that because they're not trying to fool us about that. The exception would be, um, I've sometimes seen some of my dogs who have a lot of status set another dog up to take a correction. That's not deceit. We cannot call that deceit, but they will look very good right up until they make the correction. And I think that's intentional. I think if you're very confident and you like the bite, you might say, well, I'll catch more flies with sugar than with vinegar and put on the sugar so you can catch the fly, if you will. And we also need to recognize our dogs that have those tendencies. That's not a bad dog or a good dog. That's just a dog being themselves. And I think we need to respect what, what they tell us. We just need to respect what they tell us, you know, and yeah. not hold a judgment about it. No, I, I, Teddy is never anything other than clear and vociferous about the things he doesn't like. And yeah. that is an, a, a, an eye when we are out, um, very watchful um, for the things that he doesn't like uh, so that I can um, maneuver the situation to avoid. Exactly, yep. And you know, it's like, I didn't want someone else's dog to have a bad, a bad experience with my dog either. You know, I don't want to be responsible for that because I don't want someone else to do that to me either. Um, but as I say, these poodles are just exactly the kind of dog that I, I would have kept my dogs away from with an absolute vigor. <laughs> when you were talking about your terriers, there was something you said that made me wonder whether there are, you know how we have dialects or I wouldn't say different. Yes dialects, variations on communication. Would, are you saying that different breeds may well have certain, let's call them cultural differences in the way they communicate? I would absolutely say that. Um, because when that I would... had a house, yeah, when I had a house full of terriers and I got a border collie puppy, <laughs> she loved to go around and freeze and stare at things. Well, my terriers did not take to that very well and they corrected her when she was a puppy. She learned not to do that with them, except for in moments when she would get a little too instinctive and I would intervene. So for years, if I let them out the back door into the fence yard to, to pee, I would make her lie down, send them out and then let her go out because they would tolerate her hurting them and it, because they would just ignore that but they would not tolerate her going out the door first spinning and then trying to hold them with her eye like she would sheep. They, they would have, <laughs> and I wasn't even worried about them going after her because oddly enough, they adored her and let her get away with all kinds of things. They would have gone after the dog they were out with they liked the least. <laughs> oh, I see. So they would have redirected their frustration. Yeah, on... you bet. She would, she would make um, Punch angry. So Punch would turn to Sophie and go after her. Interesting. That is, in a way, very wolfy. You know, if you've captive wolves, I think do this more than wolves in the wild do. But when I was able to study captive wolves, they had an omega. And if anybody, so let's say the alpha bitch in in the pack um, corrected one of the other bitches, that bitch would then go and pound on the omega. It was horrendous. I found that very, very difficult um, to, to deal with. But in my terriers, I would see little pieces of that and I, I didn't love it. So I really minimized it as much as I could. Yes, of course. Um, it, really what we're saying is that in many respects, they're not that different from us. I'd say not. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would <laughs> completely understand. Um, the the other thing you you talk about in your book is the that there are different i guess different motives for communication one of them being mm -hmm. intention so tell us about communication for the purpose of intention um 
I'm trying to, I want to make sure I understand the question. Ask it again. So, so I guess we, we communicate for different reasons. Yes. Okay. And that one of the primary motives for communication would be to say, I want this, or this is mine, or this is what I'm going to do. So tell us a little yeah. bit about that with dogs. Okay. If I don't answer your question in the way you're looking for, re-ask it. But I think what we're talking about is maybe taking one signal, like sniffing. And uh, I'm in a situation where the dog is not very comfortable. The environment itself is placing a pressure on the dog. The dog wishes to comfort himself, and he's going to talk to the environment, an inanimate object, you, an elephant, a goat. He's going to try to talk to any of those things just as if they are a dog. So he might start sniffing the ground. And that would be called a displacement or a vacuum activity in which he's like, I can't deal with this pressure right now. I'm gonna distract myself off the pressure that I don't really have a coping mechanism for by sniffing the ground. So if I saw my dog doing that, I would actually tell them to lie down because that gives them permission to look at the environment and they know I'm supporting them. I don't do a lot of what I would call hanging my dog out to dry. If they give me a signal that they're uncomfortable, I'm gonna say, hey, let me help you. And a down to them is a signal that they can lay down, look around and I've got their back because that's how I train it. Let's say there is a bunch of dogs around and another dog is staring at my dog and he starts sniffing the ground. He could be using it as a displacement activity, but I think in that context, he's probably very much saying to that dog, hey, I'm not threatening you. Why are you threatening me? He's then going to maybe look at that dog again and start sniffing. What he's expecting from that other dog is that that dog will give him a signal back, a, what I would call a reassurance signal. Hey, we're, we're okay. Um, let's say I pick up a dog that I don't know very well to work. I tend to have a very strong energy. And for a very soft dog, I need to tone myself back, whereas with a more uh, drivey, more instinctive, if you will, the word dominant dog, I can bring my full personality into play and they'll just meet up with that. But a more soft dog is gonna be overwhelmed by me. And so that dog might look at me and look away. So, you know, I would say to that dog, I would probably just real casually lick my lips lick my lips, or I might look at them and blink. Like, hey, yep, humans look at dogs because a lot of times I'm in a situation where I'm trying to tr train that dog to be more normal, right? So I might look at him, blink, and then feed them a treat. See if I can get some counter conditioning cooking. But what I know is when they give me a signal like that, they're expecting something back. They're looking for me to say, yep, I saw that signal, I read it, and hey, I'm chill. So that dog also could say, oh, I'll look at you for a second, but then I got to turn my face and I would look at them and then I would turn my face. Yep, I saw your signal. I see what part's making you uncomfortable. Now let's see if you can be brave enough to come up a little closer. And if I look at you for three seconds and feed you a cookie, let's see if we can get some duration here. Because I don't want a dog. There's, I think the problem is the way humans want to approach dogs and work with them is so different from their native language that sometimes we really do have to desensitize the dog to what humans do and say, listen, when I look at you directly like that, it's not threat behavior. Don't worry about that. And I would also tell you, um, I train my dogs to have amazing good eye contact and I work really hard at it because it's a good way to keep them out of trouble. At the back end of that, let's say, let's say they have done something naughty in the house. And I really do want to tell them I don't like that. I don't want you to do that. Uh, so let's say they're barking at the door and I ask them to come to me and lie down and be quiet. And they're like, screw you, I'm a little busy here. I'm going to walk up to them and I'm going to be like, hey, and I usually I tap them like I would tap somebody to get their attention. And they know that because I start out by going tap, tap. When they turn around, I feed them treats. Tap, tap. So if their back is to me and I tap them, they should turn around and get a treat from me. I also know that if they're barking facing away from me, if I can get them to turn to me, they'll stop barking. So 
upping my voice or punishing the dog is not really as effective in that instance as just getting them to turn and look at me and then lay down and then feed them for laying down or tell them good dog wherever I am in that stage, it's right? So true, because it, when Teddy is in full, in full voice, <laughs> it, uh, um, and I, I just softly say to him, Teddy darling, very often he will turn around. Not always. If he's in full flow, he's in full flow. And in those moments, I tend to just walk up to him and I, I stand in front of him and I say, what's up? Yeah, and then, exactly. And he looks at me and he does this kind of grumbling, like, hmm, yeah. hmm I'm really not happy. And I, well, I him, always tell them they can have an opinion. They just have to yeah, behave. Exactly. And I say to him, yeah, I, I know you're not happy. Come on over. So I... I bring him away and most of the time, all that needs to happen. Yeah, then you can, exactly. So it, I, it's, if it, it's, so yeah, so interpreting that body language to me is important. So if I tap, tap and they turn and look at me, then that to me is an, that's a correction. That was an effective correction. It interrupted the behavior I didn't want. I can redirect them into something I do want. So let's see, back to your original question. So the sniffing, so that's, those are different ways that they might use the sniffing or that I might say to a dog, I know that in your native language, looking is uh, a direct look is threat behavior, but when it's me and you, it's not. So here's another thing. Let's say um, I, I took the dog by the collar and I'm like, hey, you've got to stop because there are instances in which it is dangerous for the dog to continue that behavior. So I'm going to physically take hold of them to help them find their brain and say, hey, now, if they turned around and gave me direct eye contact, I would give away with my body a little pressure. I would back up and I would feed them for coming front. So that's the other thing. I don't use, I don't stare at my dogs as a correction. As a matter of fact, if I was going to be cross with them, if I take them by the comments and be like, hey, I don't do that, I actually look past them. I don't use, since I'm already saying direct eye contact is, is I know the way I'm using it is totally against your language. I totally get it. So I'm not going to use it two ways. I'm going to use it one way. And eye contact for my dogs is always an invitation to come over here. So let's say they were barking at the door and I wasn't close enough to get hold of them, but I'm like, hey, knock it off. If they turned around and looked at me, I would be like, good dog, come here, lie down. I wouldn't go up and shake them by the collar and stare at them. Because I think that that's a correction a dog would do to another dog. I think they can understand that, a dog coming up, putting pressure on them with eye contact. But since I want my eye contact from human to mean come in, leave that, come here, I'll help you. I only use eye contact in that fashion. But again, it's completely unnecessary. It, what we, all we need to do is as you said, redirect their attention. And if, redirect them. and if we're putting pressure on them, you know, there, there are occasions when I have to grab Teddy's harness when oh, we're absolutely, out. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I think we have but, to admit that there are times when we have to step are, in and say, yeah. He's about to lunge at a dog that I didn't see coming. And I know this absolutely. is good. So I will grab him. But at that point, he's already highly aroused. Right. And I just grabbed his harness. The last yep. I'm going to do is mount more pressure at him. And if he Absolutely. gives me a little bit, I as, yeah, as he turns around, and goes, what are you doing? Yeah, I say to him, it's all right, darling. I reassure him. I calm him down. I'm not going to add the pressure. Um, it, well, it's very rare that that incident would happen, but it has on occasion. And well, the I idea think we have to admit that that stuff does happen. You bet. Sure, I'm not going to do something that's going to heighten his state of arousal, make him more anxious and therefore more aggressive. The idea Absolutely. is I want to diffuse the situation, not yeah. add to it. And people don't seem to understand that their efforts to correct actually are adding to the anxiety and are being completely destructive. Yeah. Because or it with some dogs, it might not even... Mm -hmm. It might not even be anxiety. If you have a real strong character and you grab them in that moment, they might turn around and redirect. And so you'd better have a background with that animal where you can say, my eye contact with you diffuses you. 
And you that's, know, eye contact to me should be your Zen. It's your Zen place. Come to your Zen place. You know, it's very interesting because a lot of the time when we're talking about these behaviors and these reactions, I have to say, how would you feel if? Because again, we are not that different. And so we don't like people staring at us. We're okay with eye contact, but somebody staring right. at or if we are under stress, uh, again, in a situation where we're feeling a little bit exposed or vulnerable and somebody gives us a hard stare, how happy are we? Right. And in terms of, of space, if somebody is in our space and we back up a little bit and they come closer. And crouch. How do we feel? Oh, I think the word we want is threatened. Exactly. Dogs are, the, you know, they're not that different. The difference is that this is their sole means of communication. It is. And, you know, on the back side of that, and with some amusement, I tell my clients, your dogs, my pet dogs threaten me all the time, just like they would another dog. Sometimes if I walk up, they turn around and give me like, hey, get out of here. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't speak like that to mummy. I'm not going to do anything bad to them, but I'm like, hey, that's just not going to work for you. Sometimes I'll just totally ignore it and continue. Nail clipping. Come here and get your nails clipped. So they come over and they're like, I don't really want to have my nails clipped. I'm like, come on over here and lay down. They do. Good dog. I give them a treat. I do it as, you know, expediently as possible. Make it as pleasant as possible. And during the nail clipping, will they sometimes stare at me? <laughs> yeah, sure. They'll be like, get off me. And I'm like, we're doing the nails anyway. I don't do anything to, in, to either acknowledge or increase the likelihood that they would feel more uncomfortable than they already are. But I think we also need to say, if my pet dog threatens me like that, they're, they're not going to back it up, right? I mean, our average nice dog that we've trained in, blah, 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 blah. That's what I mean when I say they get to have an opinion. They just don't need, get to act on it. I don't care that they have the opinion. They cannot follow up. When I'm working with temperament evaluating shelter dogs, I'm going to feel very differently about that same behavior. Because some of those dogs are pretty much feral animals that we've pulled off the street. So now I have a feral animal that's desensitized to humans. And that's fairly dangerous sometimes. I'm not saying that all rescue dogs are like that, but there's certainly going to be a percentage of them that we need to be very careful with the way we handle them or they will bite us. And so when I'm training shelter staff, I, I point that out too. For people who are working in those situations, vet techs, veterinarians, where you don't have a choice about putting the dog under pressure to get your job done, we really need to understand that language because we need to do it to keep ourselves safe. We need to also be able to understand the difference between a dog that's got an opinion and a dog that is going to back up on the threat. And that's a context as well, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I, I think that a lot of it also comes from building trust and, and what builds trust is the dog learning that you are actually listening and that mm -hmm. you are to I agree. respectful, you know, it's when Teddy doesn't like something that I'm doing, like brushing him, for instance, if he's, yep. if he's got a you know in one of his ears and don't yep. it out, he's, or his tail and one seed's not too bad but it's when he gets a whole bunch and I'm trying to get them <laughs> and he's like enough already I've had enough I, I just let him go for a bit and then he comes back and I, I said to him okay are you ready for some more because mm -hmm. yep. ultimately what it is is that that is an unnatural situation for him and he's finding it very intense. And if he gives me one of his, I've had enough looks, I, I say to him, okay, fair enough, have a break. And then yep. more often than not, he actually comes back because he understands what I'm trying to do is help yeah, they him. Know, yeah, I think they do understand an intent. I, I, I don't think I'm being too anthropomorphic when I say that, because I can tell you in my work with aggressive dogs, which is what I was first known for certainly, um, I, I would dare say that I should have been bitten 
a lot more and a lot more violently than I have been. And I think it was A, my ability to read dogs because I'd be like, okay, you can have that opinion and that's not gonna make me go away, but I'm not gonna keep pushing right at this moment either. You know, ju ju it's a much more d dire situation in a way, but it's the same thing you just did with Teddy, where you said, okay, I'm gonna get this mat. All right, lie down, you know, let's have a little rest. Okay, let's try again, let's get another. Instead of getting real all human all over it, and getting too intense and too goal oriented and saying, hey, this is my idea and I have to have my idea. It's okay to have your idea, but I think you also need to be able to negotiate it with the animal. And I think I probably learned that when I was nine or 10 years old with my pony, <laughs> who was very fond of taking me out <laughs> and then dropping me somewhere. And then I, that's what I thought dogs were for. They were for the walk home when your pony dumped you, right? So. You know, at a young age, I learned that if I got scared and did something stupid, I hit the ground sooner. If I lost my temper and was unfair, I hit the ground sooner. And that if I <laughs> tempered my conversation and tried to represent it, that the pony was absolutely, he was a delightful little pony. He was just not going to take any BX, right? He was like, that's unfair, you're not doing that. Or you've ridden me much too long and I'm tired and I'm going home and you can hoof it home on your own. Uh, so he taught me if I was reasonable, he was reasonable. And if I was unreasonable, he was not going to be reasonable either. <laughs> so. The word you used, negotiate, I think yeah. is because it's about give and take. And what it we are is. saying, in order to have good communication, there has to be give and take. Um, Absolutely. So it's not just about you saying what you want, you also have to listen and yep. you have to give something back. And unfortunately, we've over decades got into this idea that this is a power relationship and that it's, we say what, we want and the dog is some sort of robot that must respond and therein lies a road to a lot of misery for human and dog so it's, mm -hmm. it, it, it's for the human because they're potentially putting themselves at risk but even Absolutely. if they, they are missing out on the richness of a true relationship and yeah. it's certainly misery for the dog who is being constantly misunderstood and mm -hmm. abused because that is an abuse of power if you are not willing yep. to I was yeah in my training with working in performance dogs in particular I always tell my students you know where we want to get to is that place that psychology calls power sharing without hierarchy you can never really get there because we place the dog in a human world. So I always have to lead the dance. Somebody has to lead the dance, but I can also be a really good dancing partner. You know, I don't have to step all over your toes because if I do that too much, I might be able to bully you into dancing, but I can't get you to really dance. And I love that. Yeah, I think I a lot of that comes from my work with horses. Mm -hmm. You can't just walk in and start pounding on that. It's too big. And I tell my students all the time, both directions, the ones that are too hard and the ones that are a little bit too lax with their window of expectation once they've trained a behavior, I tell them, them both, if that weighed 1,200 pounds and you had to get on it to test your authority or to test your ability to dance with this partner, however you want to think about it, how would you do? And most of them look at the dog in horror and think, I wouldn't trust my training to be able to do that. And I think training different species has helped me so much with my dog training uh, because I was definitely a horse trainer first. You know, I've always had dogs, but I didn't start professionally training dogs until about 30 years ago. Um, I think, so. you know, it would be helpful also to think about training as teaching and what is it that you want to teach your dog as you are training it to do whatever it is you're training it to do? Mm -hmm. And 
I've always wanted to teach Teddy that he can trust me. And yeah. I've teach him that when he's in trouble, he can count on me. Yeah. And I've te uh, te to teach him that we can, we can sing in harmony. Uh, yeah, most, absolutely. There are times when I know better than him. But in interestingly, there are also times when he knows better than I do. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, there, there are times when he absolutely is the one. And I've learned to trust him as well. Yeah. Um, particularly two, two examples um, where we went off piste um, in the woods on one occasion. And he's the one who found the path that was easiest for us both to walk. To go back. And, mm -hmm. You know, yep. and he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And that's happened more than, more than one occasion. And I, I now know that if we're a little bit out of where we should be, I'll just, I'll look at him and he knows. He knows that he's going to take the lead in that yep. instance. I'm going yeah. to follow. And I, I love to... It's wonderful, isn't it? It's I love to teach my students footstep tracking with dogs because all of a sudden you're not the one, you're not the one that knows what's going on anymore. <laughs> you, you know, obedience is very difficult because you have to find a beautiful way to say to the dog, do all of these behaviors that you would never do and that you think are incredibly stupid on top of that. And, and you know, how do you make that a wonderful experience for the dog? So that, that I, important to me to figure out how to do to do that but I also like to take my students and say okay we're going to track and here's the thing you can't teach your dog anything about tracking as a matter of fact you can't correct them either because you have no idea what what scent pool they're in your scent that's outside your sensory ability so you now have to say the dog is in charge of that piece the only thing I can teach a dog while tracking is to give me an indication so I can say here's the scent find this scent. When you find the scent, do this really specific behavior. I use a down, put your nose on it so that uh, you can tell me the dumb one what's going on. And sometimes in training, I'll play extra dumb. Like this is with a dog that's halfway there. They, they like know to go find the scent, lay down, put their nose on it. But then they put their nose up and look around and I'll just stand there like, I don't know where it is. I, I can't find it. Where could it be? And they'll finally look at me like, oh, for the love of Christ, woman. And, you know, and then they'll put their nose down on it, like really emphatically. And then I really reinforce that so that they, they, can, they can understand that they can help me with that, right? And, and that that is a good way to start your communication systems too by trying to find a way you can have them tell you something. Do you know, it's funny because the second um, thing I was going to tell you about involves exactly that scent. <laughs> it, uh, I had an occasion now, I, I taught Teddy um, a, a, how to basically to find objects, objects <laughs> and the yep. key, and his lead being the two primary ones that I've taught him to find. Yep. So out and on two separate occasions now, I have in fact lost his lead and he's found them, he found it. And uh, a glove, I once dropped a glove in the woods, he found it. Found it. <laughs> but there was that one incident with his lead where I was sure it was in the woods and he looked at me and he, and he said, no, it's not in there. And he went back. We had done an hour and a half's walk and we had go, got back to where we began the walk. And I was thinking, oh no, it's about to start to rain. I'm gonna be late and I'm gonna to have to redo this whole walk. But I thought, I know you'll find it. Anyway, so I'm ready to retrace my steps. And he's going, no. And he went straight it's here <laughs> where we began the walk. Yep under two minutes to find his lead. Yep. And I thought I knew where it was. I had no idea no where it idea. was. <laughs> knew exactly what to do. He went yep. into, into the field and he was circling, picking up. He must have already had picked it up when I asked him. Yep. 
and he followed it and was circling until he found it. And he, he does a brilliant indication. He, he just sits and looks where, wherever mm -hmm. it is. Or if it's on the ground, he'll actually pick it up and bring it to me, which is what he did mm -hmm. on the ground. But if, it's, um, if we're playing and I've got something above our head, head um, above, above his head, above his head he'll sit and he'll he'll look in that direction and like you sometimes I play dumb just because I love what happens yeah. next I love yeah, because they're so funny I because he he's looking he, it's a little bit vague and I want him yeah. to be more specific so I yeah. said to him you think you found it where is it show mummy and I have not taught him the words show mummy but as soon as I say show mummy off he he actually uses his face to point specifically yeah. at where it is yeah. it's magic when we listen and work with them the joy is beyond anything I felt like I'd won the lottery when he found that lead absolutely well bless you you weren't late either which is a, a icing on the cake and yeah the, I think I the, the yeah the the learning how to communicate with another species with some sort of not just joy but I think accuracy is extremely meaningful to both species. They, I don't think I'm anthropomorphizing when I say they feel that too. And I've often felt that even though I'm pretty darn good at reading dog language, um, I might catch maybe 10% of it because I think if they can't parse language. So when we put a sentence together, they can pick out a sound, they can maybe pick out a word, um, but they're not parsing language. They, it's not possible for them in their brain, as, according to the research we currently have. I don't know that we do any better with their language. I think we can catch some. I, I think you can get pretty good at it. Um, but I feel like even when I make a stumbling attempt, I swear to God, the dogs are grateful. And I think, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's certainly a feeling that feels like a spiritual pass back and forth. I think one of the most, um, I had a rescue dog and it was, it was a pit bull bitch. She was terrified of everything, just horrified of everything. And her family brings her. She had kind of was okay with the, the wife. The husband was a big teddy bear of a man, but kind of gruff. She was horrified of him. And he was nearly in tears because he's like, she doesn't like me. And I'm looking at the two of them and like, she likes you fine. She's terrified of you because she thinks you are threatening her. And they didn't recognize that. So they didn't know, they didn't have the judgment to, to how to deal with it. Uh, so I had all three of us sit down on the floor and um, the, the dog was sitting next to her mistress and she looked at me and I looked away and licked my lips, looked back at her. And she looked totally astounded. And then she walked over to me, she crawled into my lap and just pressed herself against me. You know, that's a lot of relief from an animal because they just are misunderstood and have been chronically misunderstood. And all she was looking for that was somebody that wouldn't, would give her language that she could distinguish as not threatening. So I looked at the husband and I said, did you see that? And he's like, I, I, I don't know, even know what happened. So I explained what had happened and I had him start to practice those things with her. And I used a leash because otherwise she, if he made the tiniest move that she wasn't comfortable with, she would run off. And so I've got to prevent, I've got to prevent that total escape avoidance because otherwise they're not going to look for, and you can't use food with a dog like that. She, there is no way she's going to take a treat. So I taught him how to do some body work with her, some soothing body work, some massage, um, I taught him, you know, what her signals meant and that she needed a reassurance signal back from him that was not verbal because verbal things terrified her. Um, and, you know, within two or three weeks, they call me and, and he's like, wow, you know, she's now coming up to my chair and asking to get in my lap. Yeah. Fantastic. That is a classic example of an animal just wanting to be understood and us trying to communicate in a really human way that all the dog can interpret it as is threat behavior. And as soon as I could remove just that one thing, 
You know, that wasn't any tricky clicker training or anything. That was basically just understanding the body language and, and letting this man learn it. And so it's, it's important. It's a, it's a big deal. It is a big deal because that's how you build a relationship. And it's, and it could not never be anthropomorphizing to say what you've said, because the result is evident in the relationship, in the reaction. Aww. Dog. I've always thought so, yeah. Absolutely. There's no question Thank of that. You. Spend far too much time worrying about anthropomorphizing, and that creates a barrier, actually, a lot of the it time. It can. It can. Because he was he was not a, a he was not a cruel man or abusive, although that's what the dog felt. Um it was really wonderful to be able to see the look on his face too right exactly. that he's not living with a dog that's terrified because what if the wife is going and she gets out of the house he needs to be able to catch her and the way it was it was a very dangerous situation yeah. because you know you're not always going to be both home and yeah. we need to keep that dog safe so it was it was gratifying that that was one of those instances that just floors you like it surprised even me how so little an effort on my part could make such a big difference for the animal. Well, I think that the we should mention again your wonderful book, Canine Body Language, a photographic guide interpreting the native language of the domestic dog. And so I would hope that everyone watching by now is busy uh, looking for this. I shall be putting a link in the description box um, to the interview. And if people wanted to find you, Brenda, how could they do that? It's brendaaloff.com. Wonderful. I'll have a, a link to that also in the description box. And I thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Anna. And Teddy, I can see a paw sticking up. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's because he's yeah. <laughs> very highly suspected it was something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, the pose at the moment. And he's that's just feeling right. content. That's right. So well, that's Anna, I can't thank you enough for having me um, visit you today. You and the lovely Teddy. And what a wonderful, what a wonderful conversation. Thank you thank again. You. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Um, I have lots of wonderful guests that are um, queuing up now for this month and going into October. So um, do make sure that you subscribe and you'll be able to have notice notification of when those go out. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>